Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, whenever we ended the Race in America series uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I thought that was going to be it for a while. But here we are, a special episode. If you're wondering, Kyle, why did you drop two episodes in a row? Guys, episode 149 of this podcast, the worst night of my jujitsu life, that was already recorded. I recorded that a few days ago. But then things have kind of gotten crazy again in the United States. And so uh, it's, you know, incumbent upon me to talk about it. But let's kind of get into what's happening right now and what we're seeing. And this is as of 924, the evening of what is today, August the 26th of 2020. So on Sunday, August the 23rd, 29 year old Jacob Blake was shot by police in Kenosha, Wisconsin, a, a town I'm sure none of you had heard of before this week. He was shot by his vehicle with all with three of his children inside. They, they watched this happen. He is in stable condition, but he is temporarily paralyzed from the waist down. Uh, Jacob Blake is a black man. And the officer that shot him, a, a name that was just released this evening, Rustin Shesky, is a white man. Okay. What this did is this immediately sparked outrage and riots and destruction in Wisconsin and other places. So this was Sunday night and here we are Wednesday evening and there has just been destruction and fire since that time. So businesses have been burned down. Of course, they've been looted. Um, We've had churches that have been burned down. We've had uh, elderly people that have been beaten up. We've had citizens that have been beaten up. I think there's been two or three confirmed murders uh, as a part of all of these riots and in these demonstrations. And guess what, guys? I'm I'm not seeing a whole lot of peaceful protests that have come out of all of this, but it's just been absolute chaos on the ground. And there's a lot of people fanning the flames. And the thing about it is, is there's a situation that certainly happened and everybody was, was more than willing and more than welcome to weigh in on this. So almost immediately, the governor of Wisconsin, a Democratic governor, Tony Evers, he gave this statement on what happened in this case. Here's it, or here it is. Quote, tonight, Jacob Blake was shot in the back multiple times in broad daylight in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Kathy and I joined his family, friends, and neighbors in hoping earnestly that he will not succumb to his injuries. While we do not have all the details yet, what we know for certain is that he is not the first black man or person to have been shot or injured by merci- or mercilessly killed at the hands of individuals of law enforcement in our state or our country. And we stand against excessive use of force and immediate escalation when engaging with black Wisconsinites. I've said all along that although we must offer our empathy, equally important is our action. In the coming days, we will demand just that of elected officials in our state who have failed to recognize the racism in our state and our country for far too long. So, and that's unquote there. So if you were to read that statement or hear that statement, you might think, well, man, th- this sounds pretty bad. Like what happened to this Blake guy? Like, like what exactly happened? But then Joe Biden also weighed in and he weighed in, I believe, uh, the day after this would have been Monday. And this was his uh, statement that he put up on his website here. Quote, yesterday in Kenosha, Wisconsin, Jacob Blake was shot seven times in the back as police attempted to restrain him from getting into his car. His children watched from inside the car and bystanders watched in disbelief. And this morning, the nation wakes up yet again with grief and outrage that yet another black American is a victim of excessive force. This calls for an immediate, full and transparent investigation and the officers must be held accountable. These shots pierce the soul of our nation. Jill and I pray for Jacob's recovery and for his children. Equal justice has not been real for black Americans and so many others. We are at an inflection point. We must dismantle systemic racism. It is the urgent task before us. We must fight to honor the ideals laid in the original American promise, which are which we are yet to attain, that all men and women are created equal, but more importantly, that they must be treated equally. Unquote. So again, wow, I mean, that, that's a guy that is, that is wanting to be the next president of the United States. And I mean, that's very serious sounding, right? And it wasn't just political figures that were weighing in. Of course, there were a lot of people weighing in on Twitter and in the news, but we've had a lot of athletes weigh in. A lot of guys here, you know, you like sports, you listen to this podcast, you like listening to sports. Well, Aaron Rodgers, the, the, the quarterback of the Green Bay Packers, he weighed in on this. This was the day after the shooting. He said, quote, there's a systemic problem. And until the problem is fixed, this is going to be an all too common sighting in this country. It's ob- it obviously obviously hits home being not far from Green Bay. I'm not going to comment directly on the video until more facts come out, but obviously it's something where as a non-police officer, I think for a lot of us, the natural question is when is lethal force necessary? Again, I think that that goes to a systematic problem that needs to be addressed at some point. There's antiquated laws that are prejudicial against people of color in the state. I think the governor and the folks at the Capitol need to take a hard look at some of those systems that are in place, unquote. 
and LeBron James, he hopped in on on it. He's one of the most famous athletes in the entire planet. He said this after the his Lakers beat the Portland Trailblazers on Tuesday, quote, I can't even enjoy a playoff win right now, which is the sad part, unquote. Or uh, the quote continues here. We are scared as black people in America, black men, black women, black kids. We are, we are terrified, unquote. So then on the afternoon of Wednesday, the 26th, so that's when I'm recording this, guys. I'm going to go ahead and just drop these two episodes in a row. So on today, Wednesday, the 26th of August, things got even crazier. Okay, so in the mid-afternoon, we start seeing tweets and updates that it was announced that the Milwaukee Bucks in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, that they would boycott slash forfeit game five of their series against the Orlando Magic. I mean, absolutely crazy news. This this is something on, on a different level that I can't really think of something in my lifetime that even comes close to this, that you have, you know, a number one seed in a playoff of a, of a major sport saying that we're going to sit out this game. And it seemed as if that they were okay with a forfeit. Although I, I don't really think that they were actually going to forfeit the game and, and take the L. Uh, but then they, they just said, you know, we're not playing tonight. So absolutely crazy news. And then not 30 minutes later, the Oklahoma city thunder and the Houston Rockets followed suit. And then not far after that, the Lakers and Blazers said the same thing. And then not that long after that, the NBA suspended all of the games for today right? They didn't cancel them, mind you. They, they're just going to postpone them, but they just suspended the games. And then I heard rumblings that the Milwaukee Brewers, the Major League Baseball team, that they would boycott their game. And then they ended up doing so. Ryan Braun actually said, you know, you remember Ryan Braun, the, the guy who is a dope cheat and tried to ruin a bunch of people's lives by calling them anti-Semitic whenever they basically found that he was dope cheating, that guy. Um, he said this, quote, what's happened in Kenosha hits close to home. We felt like baseball was insignificant relative to the issues, unquote. Then the Seattle Mariners followed suit. They came right after that. And then right after that, you had the Dodgers and the Giants. And then two members of my St. Louis Cardinals, Dexter Fowler and Jack Flaherty, uh, they said that they would boycott, that they were going to sit out tonight's game because the Cardinals were going to play anyway. And they said that they, quote, decided to stand in solidarity with other players throughout Major League Baseball, unquote. So, with all of these prominent, rich, hugely successful and famous people weighing in, you would think that Jacob Blake was a black man that was innocently sitting on a park bench, reading his Bible, eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, when a group of racist white cops spotted him and said, there's a Negro over there. Do you see him? Let's kill him. Right? Like, that's what you would think. After hearing the things that I've read, the quotes from these people and the actions from these people, that is what you think would have to have happened, right? Because here's the thing. As I said before, Jacob Blake is a black man. The officer that shot him, Rustin Chesky, is a white man. And that's all the media want you to know. That's all that they want you to focus on. Because narrative. Because the narrative is so unbelievably key. And it's the only thing that they have in mind. So guys, let's get into what we actually know. As of 9.32 p.m. on Wednesday, the whatever, the 26th of August, let's get into what we actually know. Okay, so the initial report that we heard was that Blake, uh, the, the guy who was shot in this situation, that he showed up to break up a fight between two women. That was the initial report and that he ended up getting shot by the cops in the process, okay? And then we saw the initial video that came out. This came out on Sunday and the video is a very short clip that shows this man, Blake, walking around his car it's an suv and he opens the the driver's side door the front door and he reaches inside his car and he's shot seven times by a police officer and that's all we saw but then not long after that we see a second video from another angle from the other side of the vehicle and this video starts a little bit earlier so you can see that there's a scuffle that is ensuing with blake and several officers on the ground it looks like the officers are trying to tase him to subdue him to arrest him but then he, he's able to get away, which is the officer's fault. They should be able to subdue him at that point. And then it shows him again, walking around the vehicle, opening up his door and then being shot. But then after that, the 911 call was released and it became apparent that he wasn't breaking up a fight. He, Blake, was actually the reason for the call, for the 911 call. He was apparently not supposed to be at this residence, right? That, that the person that called said he's not supposed to be here, but he stole a woman's keys and he wouldn't give them back. 
Okay, that's the story. That's why 911 was called. That's why officers were sent to this location. But before the police officers arrived, they were informed that Blake had not one, not two, does it sound like LeBron yet, but three warrants out for his arrest. One was for trespassing, one was for domestic abuse, and one for sexual assault. Okay? And also, these officers likely knew at some point, you know, looking at this dude's sheet, that in September of 2015, Blake was arrested for pulling a gun at a bar. Okay? So, Blake, Blake, this is the, the guy. That, that's what we know about Blake. So, the first officer shows up just a few minutes after the 911 call went out. Uh, about a minute later, a second officer shows up, and then a third officer arrives about a minute after that, and he called for more backup. And then I think they sent three more cruisers to this situation. So, they were going to have a lot of cops because apparently there was some chaos going on in this situation. Okay? The police get into a scuffle with Blake on the ground and they unsex unsuccessfully tried to tase him and subdue him that way. But Blake gets away. He gets up. He walks around to the driver's side door of his vehicle. He reaches into the driver's side floorboard while Officer Rustin Chesky is actually pulling him back by his shirt. And then Officer Chesky fires seven shots into Blake. The police immediately call for paramedics and immediately they start administering life-saving care to Blake. Uh, I think at one point he was put into a the back of an ambulance, but then he was actually air fly, uh, flighted somewhere uh, so that he can be cared for. And then there was breaking news this evening. So this is after all the NBA players did what they did and after the Major League Baseball players did what they did. State agents recovered a knife from the driver's side floorboard of the vehicle and Blake in case you just thought, oh, well, they just planted it there. Blake admitted to the investigators that he had a knife in his possession during this entire scuffle that was going on. So guys, I searched high and low. I looked at right wing sources, centrist sources, left wing sources. I looked at YouTube. I looked at live television and that's it. What I just told you is everything that's important to know about this situation. And that is all that we know at this point. So here are two very important things that we don't know for sure yet, but we have some pretty good guesses. Number one, was Jacob Blake a victim of police brutality? From what we can see right now, that doesn't really look to be the case because he had a knife on him. He was going for the knife. This is a violent criminal individual. He was in a scuffle with police officers and then he was shot. So we don't know for sure that he's not a victim of police brutality, but it doesn't look good for the counter argument. And the second very important thing that we need to know for sure that we don't know for sure yet is are Rustin Shesky and the other white officers that showed up at the scene murderous racists? We don't know that for sure. But as of this exact moment, we have no reason to believe that the man that fired the seven shots, Officer Rustin Chesky, was acting in the wrong and that he was doing so because Blake was black and because he himself is a racist. Doesn't all of this sound familiar? Because when I talked about the George Floyd situation and the Rayshard Brooks situation, there's nothing to indicate that the officers involved in those situations had race, racist animus in their hearts towards these individuals that they shot. None whatsoever. And, and we've yet to even hear weeks after I've recorded those podcasts, we still haven't seen any evidence to prove that. But, but again, the narrative is, is that these aren't just cops. These aren't just white cops. These are racist white cops, if not outwardly, implicitly biased and racist white cops. And in that, if we listen to, to people in the news and, and people like LeBron James, th these men are being hunted all day long by racist white cops, like all the cops that I've described in these situations. But we don't know anything yet, really. We've seen a couple of short videos and we've got a, a small investigation report that was released this evening. We don't know anything, but and remember, I'll take you back to what Tony Evers, the governor of Wisconsin, the Democratic governor of Wisconsin, saying this, quote, while we do not have all the details yet, what we know for certain is that he is not the first black man or person to have been shot or injured or mercilessly killed at the hands of individuals in law enforcement in our state or our country, end quote. So in the same breath, he says, while we don't have the details, I can tell you for sure this is another murder of a black man. We don't know that, but apparently Tony Evers, the governor of Wisconsin, knows that. 
And then how about Joe Biden? Let's go back to his statement. Quote, black Americans, a uh, black American is a victim of excessive force. This calls for an immediate, full and transparent investigation and the officers must be held accountable. Unquote. The first sentence says that this man was a victim of excessive force and the very next sentence says that we need to have an investigation. I did not realize that Joe Biden was a, a clairvoyant. I didn't realize that he knew things that no one else knew. I didn't realize he had the knowledge of God because apparently he does because he knows that this was just another black victim of excessive force by the police while at the same time advocating that we need a transparent and full investigation, but that the officers must be held accountable. Well, if they weren't in the wrong, what exactly are you holding them accountable to? And let's go back to Aaron Rodgers, what he said, quote, there's a systemic problem. And until the problem is fixed, this is going to be an all too common sighting in this country, unquote. What systemic problem are you referring to, Aaron Rodgers? The systemic problem of men that are having 911 called on them because of their actions and then reaching for a weapon, presumably in this situation, allegedly reaching for a weapon and then getting shot for their trouble. Is that the systemic problem that you're referring to? And then we got LeBron James tonight. Again, this guy, I mean, this guy is a guy that we should absolutely look up to and we should let our kids wear his jerseys and everything. And I'm not going to read it out loud, but you can read it for yourself. It has three quarters of a million likes on Twitter. But it was, quote, F this man, we demand change. Sick of it. And he just tweeted that today. What exactly is the this that he's effing F this man? You know, what change is he demanding? What exactly is he sick of? Is he sick of black people being shot by police when presumably that's what should have happened? When black people are attacking police or reaching for weapons, presumably, allegedly, to use to engage in the fight with police officers, what exactly is he sick of? Because right now it just seems like he's screaming at the sky. But here's the thing, guys, is we don't know anything yet. The investigation hasn't happened. But in the eyes of most of these woke people, in the eyes of these Democrats, in the eyes of these leftist politicians and athletes and all these individuals, they already know. And that's the narrative that you will be fed because it is all about the narrative, guys. We've talked about this over and over and over. Narrative is king. And so in light of all that, I've just got some random thoughts and then we'll let you guys get out of here. These are random thoughts and some pro tips that I've thrown in. Maybe the first pro tip is this. Before you express a strong opinion on a controversial topic, maybe wait for more facts to come out. Do you guys remember the first three episodes of the Race in America series? Remember me telling you in episode one that, hey guys, I've spent the last two months thinking about the situation going on, uh, you know, uh, all of the ripple effects from the George Floyd killing and all those different things. I took months, literally months to read and, and watch and think about what was going on and, and solicit opinions and, and to go into this before I released my opinion and my thoughts on this issue. And I think I did a pretty dang good job of, of formulating my thoughts in a way that was cogent and expressible in ways for you to be able to take away things from that and digest it. But this happens immediately. People go with the initial report that this was just a good Samaritan that saw a couple of women fighting and was trying to break it up. And they just ran with that. And now that's the paradigm in their brain. And here's, here's the thing, guys, is you might be thinking, well, Kyle, aren't you, you know, going against your own pro tip? Like here you are giving a strong opinion. Guys, the shooting happened three days ago. We've got information that has come out just this evening, just a few hours ago. There was the report that was released that he had a knife in his car. That's what he was presumably reaching for. And he admitted that in his investigation, in, in the investigation, the investigators, he admitted it right to them saying, yeah, I had a knife in my possession, right? So. Why do we feel the need? It's this, it's this hot take generation. We're in this hot take thing where everything has to be a hot take, right? You can't wait for things to come out because if you wait, then you don't get to ride that wave of, of woke likes and retweets, right? Because you waited too long to give your opinion. So there's no virtue in just waiting until more of the facts come out, right? You can't do that. That's just crazy. Why would anyone do that, Kyle? But guys, 
If you're going to be like this, especially Christian men, right? Before you go putting your foot in your mouth and, and to prevent yourself from having to eat crow later, just wait a second. Just wait a few seconds to figure out the lay of the land before you just, you know, go off and start half cocked shooting around and just going and saying crazy things. It's ridiculous. So here's the next random thought. Screw the National Basketball Association. Screw the NBA, guys. I am fully reconsidering my position on boycotting things. I'm I'm done with the NBA. I am completely done. Guys, they lost me when they put the name of a Marxist organization on their court, Black Lives Matter, right? And here's the thing, guys, is again, this is kind of a semantic thing to where it's like, oh, they're, that's not Black Lives Matter, the organization. That's the Black Lives Matter, the sentence. Come on, Kyle, you got to understand the nuance here. But but guys, that that is not just, as I said, I've said it so many times, I've said it in all those other episodes, Black Lives Matter is not a sentence anymore. It is the name of an organization. It is the name of a movement, right? So, so guys, if I have, or I thought about this the other day, there's a band that I really liked that I listened to in high school and college. The name of the band, ISIS. Well, just a few years after I stopped listening to that band, well, wouldn't you know it, ISIS became the, the common name for one of the grossest and most evil terrorist organizations in the Middle East, ISIS. And so I can still be a fan of that band, but I would be hard pressed to tell you that whenever I hear the word ISIS, that I think about this obscure metal band that went on tour with Tool once, right? We think about the terrorist organization. So if you say Black Lives Matter in August of 2020, no one's thinking about the sentence. They're they're thinking about the organization. They're thinking about the movement because that's what we've been told to do, right? And then they also, they had all the messages on the jerseys, right? You know, equality and, and peace and you got to vote and Black Lives Matter and say their names and, and all those different things. And now you've got them boycotting games, which these dummies don't realize they're boycotting their own business. Like, it's so un- unbelievable. Don't they understand that they are in business with the owners and there is no business if there is no games? There's already a tremendous drop in revenue because they don't have thousands of people at these playoff games buying beer, buying pretzels, buying nachos, buying shirts, buying jerseys. They don't have that revenue. They just have the TV revenue. The The ratings have tanked. Because people are, they're not down with all this Black Lives Matter stuff either. Like they're not down with the kind of the Marxist messages and being bullied into being told what to do. Like they're not down with that. And then it, the faux outrage of these players, especially LeBron James, the, just the outrage. And they can't really tell you the outrage that they're specifically referring to. And here's the thing that's interesting is where was all of their outrage on, on other topics? You know, LeBron, it's outrage. He's, you know, saying the F word on Twitter. I never heard him talk about the sweatshops that Nike has overseas. I've never heard him talk about that. He doesn't seem to be outraged that there are children putting together his ugly basketball shoes for 25 cents a day. I I haven't quite heard that from him yet. And what about the outrage over how China is treating Hong Kong? You know, they were outraged that the GM of the Houston, uh, Houston Rockets would, you know, just possibly come out and say that the, the way that they're treating things and the is not pro, is not the right way of doing it and he was maligned by all the players and do y'all remember that one time when lebron james tweeted about what the the chinese government was doing to the uyghur muslims oh oh wait yeah you you missed that oh it was because he never tweeted about it i haven't i haven't seen any nba players talk about their outrage at the fact that the the chinese government the communist atheistic evil government of China is putting Muslims, whom I disagree with vehemently about their religion, putting them in concentration camps, shaving their heads and putting them on trains and sending them to God knows where, to to modern day gulags. Where was the outrage about David Dorn? That was a black man, if you'll remember, I think it was a 70 year old black man, former police chief in St. Louis that was killed outside of his friend's shop because he was trying to guard it from Black Lives Matter people. Do you remember the outrage from those, from these NBA players about David Dorn? How about this? Have you seen outrage about any child killed by stray bullets in Chicago? The two year olds, the five year olds, the seven year olds. Do you know any of their names? Do you? I bet you don't. I bet if LeBron James were in front of me right now and I asked him to give me one name, 
One name of somebody this year that was killed in Chicago by gang violence that was a neutral party, he wouldn't be able to give me a name. Because here's the thing, I'll just speak directly uh, to LeBron in this case here. I dare you to leave the bubble. I dare you to leave the NBA bubble and show everyone just how righteous you are and leave that maybe last opportunity to win a championship in order to fight for justice. Make it your full-time job. Go to every city where a unarmed black man is killed by police and fight for justice right there. I want you to also go, if you have time, LeBron, let's go ahead and make sure you go to Chicago. Let's go to Baltimore. Let's go to Detroit. Let's go to Los Angeles. Go, let's go to these places where blacks are being slaughtered by other blacks. And I want you to talk about your outrage for that too. And how tired of it you are, how sick of it you are. Because guys, this is what, what's actually happening. By doing what they're doing, these NBA players are signaling that they're on the side of the rioters and looters. And they may not have to just come right out and say it, but they're pretty much saying it with their actions. So you guys need to think really seriously about your support for the NBA because I'm done with them. And I live in Oklahoma City. There's no more thunder for me, right? There's going to be plenty of uh, Thunder fans whenever we come back out of this COVID-19 stuff. Not for me. I'm out. The next thought I have here, sorry it took so long on that one. It was important. The next thought here is that major sports leagues are trying to hold American viewers hostage and we must make them pay by turning off our televisions, by unfollowing them on Twitter and Instagram, by, by not commenting on their videos, by, by not sharing any stuff on YouTube. Because this is what they're basically saying, what we're seeing mainly from the NBA and then with, you know, pockets of Major League Baseball. It's essentially this. You like watch, watching us play sports on TV. So instead of watching us play sports on TV, you should just hear our cries for racial justice or something. Right? Because that's what these people are doing. And there is a tremendous opportunity for sports leagues to instead of just hopping on the woke bandwagon and trying to impress all the blue check mark people on Twitter to just say, you know what, this is a sport. So maybe hockey can do it. You know, maybe, maybe the UFC can be that sport. Maybe, you know, Aussie rules football can be that sport, something. And they can just say, you know what, there's a lot of problems in the world and a lot of different areas. And we play sports because we want people to come together and to be able to cheer for or against a team. And that for, for that to be the most, um, you know, dramatic thing that happens is you're cheering for the team in red and you're cheering for the team in yellow, you know, whatever the situation is. That's, that's what a league should come through and say, just to push back on the mob, right? Do what Trader Joe's did when everyone freaked out because they had, you know, some salsa called like Trader Jose's or something like that. They're originally going to take it off the shelves and rename it. And then they finally realized they're like, no, we're not going to do that. That's dumb. This isn't racist. Like this is respectful of the Latino coach, the culture. And that's why we sell this. And that's why people love it. Like, ah, we're just not doing that. I mean, do you realize how many more people would maybe not be NHL fans normally, but now it's like, well, they don't have any basketball to watch. They might as well watch the Stanley Cup playoffs, right? Next thought here is, remember when I said, and guys, I don't like to pat myself on the back, but do you remember when I said that you can never be woke enough or, or bow low enough before the mob? I was right. Because here's the thing. The NBA basically allowed everything that the players wanted, right? They, they, they never said no. Oh, okay. Yeah. Y'all want to put messages on your jerseys. That doesn't really make sense that you would put the name equality or black lives matter on the back. Well, I mean, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's put it on the jerseys. They all, but encouraged kneeling for the national anthem. So that was good. They made sure that was prominently shown on television. Uh, the NBA is like, Oh yeah, sure. Let's put black lives matter on the court. That makes a lot of sense, but it wasn't enough. They let the players self cancel games without any retribution. It was encouraged because let's say Adam Silver would have done this, which he, he never would have done this because he's a crazy far lefty, but let's say he would have said, okay, Milwaukee Bucks, uh, we, uh, we appreciate, uh, the decision that you've made, um, especially during this time, but, uh, you had a scheduled game today, uh, this afternoon and you didn't play that game. And per the rules of any sport ever anywhere on the planet, that means you forfeit a playoff game. It, I mean, would there have been anything else? I think that would have made the series uh three, two at that point, you know, uh, what if the NBA would have done that? 
Of course, they would never do such a thing. But guys, this is what I'm saying. For those of you that are trying to appease the mob by, by bowing low enough and begging for forgiveness and, you know, they, they yell at you in a restaurant and you just hold up your fist and just hope that they don't see you holding up your fist not as high as the person on the other side of the restaurant, you can't bow low enough. You can't apologize loud enough. You can't be woke enough. The mob will eat you alive. And what we're seeing right now is the NBA is eating itself. Because their, their ratings were already in the toilet whenever they came back. Maybe that's just because of, you know, COVID and people are just focused on other things or they've got other things going on. But you would think that there wasn't live sports for anyone to watch, really, except for some random fights and some random races internationally. And then the NBA comes back and no one wants to watch. Could it have anything to do with the fact that you have a Marxist slogan and, you know, revolt group? that you have their name right there on the court, could that have something to do with it? Could it have something to do with the players putting the messages out there constantly uh, about how the United States is just full of racists and if you're white, you're just one of those racists and there's nothing you can do about it and no way that you can change their mind? Do you think that has anything to do with it? It's ridiculous. Next thought here is that there is no punishment for evil as long as you have the right narrative working for you. Again, it's all about the narrative. So Sean King, and I got to be honest with you. I know the name Sean King. I know he does things on Twitter. I don't know what this guy does for a living. I mean, does he run a website? You know, does he, I don't know, did he used to write a book? I, I have no idea, but I do know what he wrote on Twitter and it's unbelievably evil. Quote, and I'm not going to say all the quotes because I, I can't say it all on a family show, but here we go. Quote, to the Kenosha Police Department, if you do not name the officer who brutally shot Jacob Blake on Sunday, we will simply begin naming officers from your department who may or may not be him. F it. Your protection of his identity is unethical. What is his name? Unquote. Twitter came out and said that this didn't violate their terms of service. A threat to dox police officers that are not involved with the shooting or ones that are involved with that shooting to just put all of their information out there. Ah, it's okay. It's within the terms of service. You know, Trump tweets something about, you know, hydroxychloroquine and it's like, no, we got to shut down Twitter for a day. Right. But again, guys, Sean King is one of them. He's a lefty blue checkmark person on Twitter. He thinks the right things. So the things that he says must be right because he has the right ideology. And this dovetails nicely into the next thought here. Marxist Democrats. If this is getting political, sorry, if this isn't your bag, there's plenty of other podcasts out there. Marxist Democrats are threatening everyday Americans and trying to bully them into submission. We're seeing it all over the country. We're just now seeing it with Kenosha, Wisconsin. We're seeing it with these people. There's basically a threat. Democrats are telling you that if you don't vote blue in November, you know, for, for Senate and House and for the presidency, then that's it. It's Molotov cocktails every day. Perhaps it'll be your business that we burn to the ground today, right? Because people have got this idea that, oh, well, these people have insurance so they can just rebuild their businesses. It's no big deal. This is about justice. Well, what these morons don't understand is that most insurance has a deductible that you have to come out of pocket for and that your future insurance rates are going to go up invariably, right? So what you're doing is you're stealing from these people at the very least, the amount that they've increased in their premiums or the amount that is going to be part of what they have to pay in their deductible. But that's the threat. That is the non veiled threat from these people is we will continue to do this because guys, here's the message. Joe Biden, who has been in May in, in the Senate, he's been in the public sphere. He, he's been a, a politician for almost half a century that He's now ready to end racism. He is now ready to end equality. And if you just elect him in November, all this goes away. America is no longer a racist country. I mean, even though we elected a black president uh, for two terms and he won by landslides both times, but that, that didn't prove anything. If we elect this old white guy, if we elect him, who su supported busing as his own VP pounded him on, who said some pretty racist things in the past. If we can just elect him, then we'll put our Molotov cocktails away. There will be no need to riot anymore. No need for all this fighting and all of the fires and all the riots and the, and the looting and, and the glass breaking and the, the 
gunshots firing in the blocking traffic. We, we won't have a need for that anymore. So we'll certainly talk more about the election as it gets closer. That's just something to keep in mind. And the last thing is here is I'm going to do something that you may have been, you may be really surprised to, to know that I would actually even think to do. And it's this, I want to give Black Lives Matter some advice. I, I want Black Lives Matter to make a few changes. I, I think I can really help them. If, if you know someone that works for Black Lives Matter, just let me know. I think I can help them with their marketing. I can help them with their language. You know, I'm, I'm kind of an expert at that. So, so just let me help them. And the, the biggest advice that I would give Black Lives Matter right now is could you just pick some better martyrs? Maybe just one. Because Jacob Blake, this situation, again, I don't presume to know most of the things about this situation, but it doesn't look good right now for, for his sake being a martyr. This was a violent criminal with a rap sheet whose presence of, of the, the officers were caused by his actions to start. Uh, he seemed to be reaching for a weapon and, and the investigation will tell us whether or not that was the case. It's not looking good for his case as a martyr. Okay. And then they've got Michael Brown that they still hold up as a martyr. Even Joe Biden mentioned Michael Brown recently. Remember the guy who they said had his hands up and he was on his knees begging for his life whenever he was executed by the police. Officer Darren Wilson, I think it was his name. Oops, except there were two federal investigations and one of them by the Obama Justice Department that said that's actually not what happened. Uh, Michael Brown was actually on his way to attack the cop again whenever he was shot for his trouble. So he doesn't really fit the, the mold of a good martyr. And then we got Richard Brooks, which I, I talked about his situation at length, but he fought with two cops. He tried to shoot one with his own taser, got shot for his trouble, maybe doesn't uh, meet the standards. And then we've got the name that's on everybody's lips right now, and that's Breonna Taylor, right? We've heard a lot about that name, you know, say her name and, you know, we need to arrest those cops. And, you know, even the Tampa Bay Rays, they, they tweeted out, hey, it's opening day, which is a great, great uh, reason to you know, arrest these cops, you know, for, for killing Breonna Taylor. Well, there's a lot of conflicting information right now, and I don't presume to know anything because I, I don't have the, not more knowledge than you do, but there seems to be more indications that Breonna Taylor was actually a part of a drug dealing ring and a drug smuggling ring. So everyone's like, oh, it was her boyfriend whose house that she was living in or apartment that she was living in that was part of this, this drug deal thing and that she had nothing to do with it. That doesn't really seem to be the case. That there's evidence that she actually muled drugs for, for her boyfriend, right? And for other people. And that may end up not being true. And guys, guess what? If it's found out that everything that I just told you is inaccurate, you will 100% hear me talk about it on a future episode. And I will refer back to this one so that I can correct the record. I won't edit this episode. I'll just correct the record later. But is Breonna Taylor uh, the, the person that you want your, your young black daughter to look up to? Is she your martyr? And then we've got George Floyd. Because guess what? There was some breaking news about George Floyd today. And guys, before you think I'm going to say anything that I'm not going to say, that I think one of the biggest reasons that George Floyd is dead today is obviously because of what Officer Derek Chauvin did. But the breaking news today is that the amount of fentanyl that was in his system at the time of his death was enough to kill him. The, the report said that his lungs were twice the weight that they should have been, which is a a sign of fentanyl overdose. Basically, the, the person that did this report said that if he had died in his apartment by himself, they would have put the cause of death as overdosing from fentanyl. So this is a guy who had a rap sheet. This is a guy who died with fentanyl and meth in his system. This is a guy that resisted arrest. This is a guy that I think pointed a gun in the face of a pregnant woman while he robbed her. This, this is another one of your martyrs. So to Black Lives Matter, and I mean this sincerely, I want you to bring me stories like Medgar Evers, right? And guys, don't worry in the show notes, I'll, I'll give you some stuff. So if you don't know the name Medgar Evers, you should get to know that name. Bring me someone that looks like that. You know, I was talking with someone, a buddy of mine today that it will be listening to this episode here shortly. I, I, I would, would imagine, but if let's take that ridiculous scenario I said earlier, let's say it is just a black man sitting on a bench, reading his Bible, eating a peanut butter and jelly, minding his own business and racist white cops literally targeted him because he was black and shot him for no reason. If you can bring me one of those cases, let me know where to show up. I will walk with you. I will march with you. 
I will hold a sign that I've made myself and I will peacefully protest that unbelievable sin that was propagated and that came out of the racist ideology, right? I I will do that. But that's not what you're bringing me. What you're bringing me are Jacob Blake and Michael Brown and Rashard Brooks and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. And at the very least, all of these situations are muddy, right? Some of these situations are very clear and they're getting clearer as they do more investigations. But you're bringing me these muddy situations where most of the time the cops were acting within their rights and within their training. What exactly do you expect me to do with that? Because I I want to be on your side. I really do. Because if we do have systemic racism and you can point me to specific examples, I'm willing to fight with you. But you're not bringing me anything that I can fight for. You're bringing me useless platitudes. You're bringing me nonsense. You're bringing me things that don't help anybody except for people that are driving a narrative. So if all you want to do is win the narrative game, that's one thing. But if you actually want to correct the sin, you got to give me something else. All right, guys, before we let you go, we will do a quick resilience boost. As you know, by now we are a men's ministry and our mission is cultivating manly resilience. Specifically, we do that by providing you content like this podcast. that helps you forge spiritual, mental, and physical toughness. So for today, I've, I've got a slight deviation, but I've had a lot of people reach out to me since last week's episode when I did those five stories that you probably weren't aware of and ask me, Kyle, where do you get your news? It's so hard for me to find news. I feel like I have to get a piece from over here and a piece from over here and try to bring it together. I just can't get the straight shot. So I'm going to give you the list or I'm going to give you the website links for several websites that are center right that I feel like do a great job of when they're reporting the news. Okay. You can kind of tell when they're giving conservative commentary. But I feel like they're doing the best job of just reporting the news, especially about the things like what we're seeing right now with the situation in Kenosha. Okay. So those four websites are these, right? And you might think, oh, you're crazy. These are center right. I'm telling you from the very beginning, they have a conservative bend. The Daily Wire, The Daily Caller, The Federalist, and Town Hall. So follow those websites, do an RSS feed, follow them on Twitter, follow some of their writers on Twitter. I feel like you'll start to get some of these stories that you may not get from your CNNs or your MSNBCs or even Fox News. And the last thing I've got for you is a link to the Wikipedia page for the life of Medgar Evers. So you should probably familiarize yourself with that man. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening to the podcast. If you would, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or Stitcher, and refer your friends to listen and share this on social media. Guys, if we deserve a five-star review, leave us five stars and a few sentences letting us know why you like the content. I'm currently booking speaking engagements for the rest of 2020 and the beginning of 2021, so if you want to come speak to your team, at your business, at your men's event, at your camp, hit me up, info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. The website is www.undaunted.life. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at undauntedlife or facebook.com back slash Undaunted Life. Check out our free devotionals on the Uversion Bible app. Just search Undaunted Life under plans. And as always, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their entire music library for our content. The intro outro track on this podcast is their song Defender, which is off their latest record entitled Guardians. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep cultivating manly resilience. Keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical toughness. Keep seeking the Lion of Judah. Whoa!